Good morning. God, God bless each and every one of you. Man, I'm working good today, ain't I? <laughs> yeah, praise the Lord. Uh, just good morning, and God bless each one of you. We're so thankful that you're here. And um, uh, today is the first Sunday of Advent, and we're going to light our Advent candle, and I asked my lovely wife to do that today. So if you would come forth there and light that candle, and um, uh, we'll celebrate the first Sunday of Advent. The first candle is, the, is purple. It's a candle of hope. And we have hope because God is faithful, and he will keep the promises made to us. Our hope comes from God. Amen? Thank you, dear. You did that rather well. <laughs> We just praise the Lord today. How many of you have come because you want to hear from the Lord today? Amen. Don't we serve a wonderful God? I hope that you had a wonderful Thanksgiving, as wonderful as mine. My wife made me all kinds of wonderful food and uh, turkey and pumpkin pie and all kinds of stuff. And um, uh, it was a great day. And I hope you're, you had a great day. Uh, this is the Christmas season, and it's my favorite time of the year, and I hope it's your favorite time of the year. Jesus is the greatest Christmas gift that was ever given. Amen? Amen. We should love him, and I know that you do. I'm not trying to talk you into loving Jesus. I know you already love Jesus, and I'm just I'm thankful for what he does in our lives. This morning, the name of my sermon is Jesus, our mountain mover, our mountain mover. And um, uh, the text for that is in Matthew 17, verses 20 through 21. And um, uh, when I was just a boy in grade school, my older brother came running into the house screaming, they're after me, they're after me. And my dad wanted to know what was happening. And before he could even answer, before my brother could even answer, there was loud knocks at the door. And I don't have me a good place to knock, but there you go. And there was loud knocks at the door. And for some reason, there was three boys from his high school who wanted to talk with him. Let's put it that way, to talk with him. They wanted to have a word with him. And my brother didn't want to go out and fight them and and he was pleading with my father to take care of this situation. And I remember my dad shocked me by saying, you either go out there and take care of this problem now, or it will find you later. Now, I'm not saying that if someone's knocking on your door and they want to fight with you, that you need to go outside. But we can't run from our problems, can we? They, they always end up following us wherever we go, and they track us down, and we sooner or later we have to deal with them. And so my brother went outside to face them, and I thought, man, that was, that, that's pretty brave. I couldn't believe what was happening before my eyes. And um, uh, now my sermon would be a whole lot more exciting if I could tell you that my brother used his karate to put a good whooping on him. But that's not what happened. And um, uh, in fact, my brother didn't know any karate. But um, uh, when he went outside, what happened was they were a whole lot more interested in talking than they were fighting. And I don't know if that was because my dad was standing there in the doorway or exactly what it was. That might have had something to do with it. Um, uh, I think my dad knew all along that they were going to be more interested in talking than fighting. But I remember my dad saying, it is not the size of the man that matters. What matters is the size of the fight in the man. And um, uh, he always used to tell me, you need to look out for the little guys because the big guys, the harder they, the bigger they are, the harder they fall. Now, you know, people, you, you've heard that saying before, right? The bigger they are, the harder they fall. But you never have anyone tell you that the bigger they are, the harder they are to knock down, do, do they? They never tell you that part of it. But um, uh, one thing that happens, 
One thing that life has taught me is that the problems we face are always appear bigger than they are, just like those three boys that day. Uh, they appeared to be a giant, and my brother didn't want nothing to do with it. Uh, life ha always has a way of making your problems look like mountains when most of the time they turn out really to be just mohills. Amen? Have you ever, can, can you think of a time when you had a problem that just seemed like it was unmovable and it really turned out to be nothing? A lot of times our problems turn out to be not that difficult. In Matthew 7, 14 through 20, Jesus tells us a story that teaches the same life principle that I believe my dad was trying to teach us that day. The backdrop here is the Lord. Peter, James, and John are coming down from the Mount of Transfiguration. Can you imagine what that would have been like? To have been up there on the mountain with Jesus when he was transfigured and, and his glory was shown. But they're coming down the mountain and Matthew uh, 17, verse 14 starts like this. And it says, and when they came down to the crowd, a man approached Jesus and knelt before him, Lord, have mercy on my son. He said he has seizures and is suffering greatly. He often falls into the fire or into the water. I brought him to your disciples, but they could not heal him. Jesus says, you unbelieving and per perverse generation. Jesus replied, how long shall I stay with you? How long shall I put up with you? Bring the boy here to me. And Jesus rebuked the demon and it came out of the boy and he was healed at that moment. Then the disciples came to Jesus in private and asked him, why couldn't we drive it out? He replied, because you have so little faith. Truly, I tell you, if you have faith as small as a mustard seed, you can say to this mountain, move from here to there, and it will move. Nothing will be impossible for you. Jesus knew something about life that his disciples hadn't completely grasped yet, and that is that we all have troubles, we all have problems, and faith is the key to overcoming those problems. And the bigger the obstacle, the more faith it requires. Or at least that's what I put here. I'm not for sure if it takes a lot of faith to overcome obstacles, but it does take a little bit of faith. Amen? I, I think if we, just, if we just trust Jesus a little bit, it'll get us through. But if we have great faith, and Jesus said there were people who had great faith, then that's got to be better. Amen? Faith, faith may not always change the outer circumstances of our obstacles. The size of our obstacles, the appearance of our obstacles. I mean, David's face didn't change the size of Goliath. And it didn't change how scary he looked because everybody else there was scared that day. But faith always changes the way we see and relate to the problems that we face. Amen? Faith changes our life. Hebrews 11.1 1 says, Faith is the assurance of things hoped for and the conviction of things not seen. You could read Hebrews 11 one like this. Faith is the guarantee of things hoped for and the belief of things not seen. The assurance, another word for assurance is guarantee. With God, we get guarantees. And frankly, the way we see our problems make all the difference in our lives. Amen? Just as King, just ask King David, it's not the size of the giant, but how you see him. If your problems look unmovable and terrifying to you, then you're not seeing them through the eyes of faith. And that's, that's the way we're supposed to live. We're supposed to live by faith and not by sight. First John 4, 18 says, There is no fear in love, but perfect love drives out fear because fear has to do with punishment. The one who fears is not made perfect in love. Perfect love leaves no room for fear. Now, if I was to measure that just in my own life, I'd say maybe my love isn't completely perfect yet because there are still times when I fear, but not near as often as I used to. 
One of the most common commands, statements in Scripture, is be strong and be of good courage, fear not. It's never the size of our problems that determine the outcome, but it's what's inside that matters. It's your faith that determines your life, and especially your eternity. Prayer is the vehicle by which we come to God, and faith is the key that unlocks the power of God to intercede in our lives. You understand that? We, we come to God through prayer, and faith unlocks His power in our lives. Faith changes our lives. It creates new possibilities, new realities. What do I mean by that? I mean that faith can create new possibilities that did not exist before. Faith enlarges the options because faith brings God directly into our situation. What, what's your problem today? What, what are you facing? Maybe, hopefully it's nothing, amen? But whatever it is, faith and prayer brings God directly into your situ situation. And God can always do far more than we could ever think or imagine. In fact, Paul said it like this, Ephesians 3.20, Now to him who is able to do amazingly more than all we can ask for or imagine according to his power that is at work within us. See, God could do it all from heaven. But for some reason, he likes to work through his children. And that is to teach us to trust in him. What power, the power of faith that comes from the living, from the Holy Spirit living within us. Humanly speaking, when the Israelites were trapped with the Red Sea before them and the Egyptian army behind them, I'll bet Moses never considered parting the Red Sea. But the faith Moses had in God of the impossible opened a whole new range of possibilities that never existed before. Amen? Now, we, you, you never hear of anybody parting the Red Sea anymore, do you? But God can still do it. We sung that song today. God can still do miracles. He's still our mountain mover. The Red Sea, giants that we face, the fiery furnaces, the lion den, dens that are represented in the Bible represent to us the unlimited possibilities of life with Christ as our Savior. Amen? No one would have thought that the Red Sea was going to part. No one would have believed that David was going to whip Goliath. No one would have believed that the, when the three Hebrew children were thrown into the fiery furnace, that they, would, that they would be completely unharmed, not even smell like smoke. No one believed that Daniel would sleep comfortably all night in the lion's den. But when God was in the equation, anything was possible. And I want you to know that as Christians, we need to live with that anything is possible attitude. Amen? Our God still does miracles. And I've always told you, the greatest miracle of all is when he saves someone from their sins. Amen? What did Jesus say? Truly, I tell you, if you have faith as small as a mustard seed, you can say to this mountain, move from here to there, and it will move. Nothing will be impossible for you. He doesn't say that nothing will be impossible for me. He says that we actually... The power works through us, it works in our lives, and nothing will be impossible for us. Now, I'm not going to get into the debate whether God does it or we do it, but our faith is the key that unlocks the power of God. And I would also say that when God speaks about nothing being impossible, it means nothing being impossible in accordance with his will. I, now, I could pray to be an astronaut, but I don't think I'm ever going to be one. But I could pray for this mountain to move. And if I need it, if it's the will of God, the mountain will move. When we pray, we factor God into the equation of our lives. And faith opens up endless possibilities of solutions to our problems. 
this man approaches Jesus and knelt before him, Matthew 17, 15, and he says, Lord, have mercy on my son. How many times have we prayed for our children? <laughs> many times, amen? We pray for them every day. I want you to know that you don't have to wait until everything has failed. You can go to God and fall on your knees and ask God to help you right now. This man goes and he says, he had, he says his son has seizures and is suffering greatly. He often falls into the fire or into the water. Uh, he's, I, I guess he's trying to kill himself. This man had a real problem. And as a father, I can really identify with him. Can you imagine having a son like that? But what the scripture is really saying is that his son is demon-possessed. And we know that from Matthew 17, 18, where it says Jesus rebuked the demon and it came out of the boy and he was healed from that moment. You see, Jesus moved the mountain in that boy's life. Amen? He healed him. And Jesus is the healer. He always heals. The man then says, Matthew 17, 16, I brought him to your disciples, but they couldn't do anything. They couldn't heal him. But I want you to know that there are some mountain-sized problems that we will face in life that are too big for us to handle. Amen? Y'all know about those kind of problems? Hopefully you're not going through any now. They're too big for you and they're too big for me as your pastor to handle. But they're not too big for God. Amen? God can handle your problem, your mountain, no matter how big it is. And it's through faith that God is figured into the equation and becomes the solution to our problems. I don't know why, but it seems human pride keeps us from turning to God right from the beginning. H have you ever had a big problem and you tried to fix it yourself? You, tried, you, you, you called your parents, hey, hey, I need some money, or I need this, or I need that. We always seem to want to fix our problems ourselves. Often, when we try to solve our problems in our own way, it doesn't turn out. And when that fails, we pick up the phone and we look for someone else to help us. Amen? Just like my brother did that day. Dad, Dad, help me. Well, he had the right ideal, but he was calling on the wrong father, wasn't he? How silly is it when we have Jesus, the mountain mover, as our Savior, and we don't call on him right from the very beginning? Jesus said in John 16, 33, he said, In this world, you will have troubles, but take heart. I have overcome the world. And what Jesus is really saying there, if you want to put it like in today's English, he's saying, you know what? The world has a lot of problems. But don't worry about it because I have overcome all of them. I am the way. Just follow me. Just trust in me. Jesus is saying the world's problems doesn't matter because I have overcome them. Whether you're a Christian or you're or not, you're going to have problems. But with God as your king, there's always an endless and impossible possibility that he can bring to bear on your problem. Because you see, God is the author of the unseen and the unknown possibilities, the unthought of possibilities. God is the author of the impossible. Jesus is the mountain mover. Mountain here, you could really say, is another word for our problems. Amen? Now, I, I've never seen a mountain move, but I've seen Jesus solve problems. And here in this, when you hear the word mountain, you almost think, my problems. Problems. Now, I want to focus on what Jesus said directly to his disciples today. Because I think that's where the meat of the message is. Matthew 17, 19 to 20. Then the disciples came to Jesus in private and asked, why couldn't we drive out the demon? Now, he had sent them out. And they had been healing people and doing miracles and meeting the needs of the public. But here's a case that they couldn't, they couldn't cure. He replied, because you have so little faith. Truly, I tell you, if you have faith as small as a mustard seed, you can say to the mountain, move from here to there, and it will move. Nothing will be impossible for you. Now, that's not what I say. That's not what I'm saying. I'm not telling you that nothing is impossible for you, but Jesus is saying that. Amen? 
What did Jesus say to those who had been learning from him for the last three years? This is near the end of Jesus' ministry. And these men had been following him. And he says, because you had such little faith. You believed so little. Life-changing faith comes by experiencing the resurrected Christ in our lives and learning to trust him with our problems. They had experienced the resurrected Christ yet, but, they, but when they did, it transformed their lives completely. They went from really sniveling cowards who hid on the day of crucifixion to men who became bold, who preached for Jesus, and who died for Jesus. Amen? Faith makes all the difference in our lives. We've experienced the resurrected Christ and we believe and there should be nothing impossible for us if we just trust and believe in Jesus. We build our faith by overcoming one obstacle of, in life at a time while we trust in Jesus. Now, if, if an obstacle comes, let's say your son gets thrown in jail, and you bail him out, they, that may be one way of meeting his need. But it might also be shortchanging short the need that what God wants to do in his life. We, we need to do things prayerfully. Amen? We, can't, we don't want to supersede or move past the miracle that God has planned. In every problem, God has a solution already planned out. In fact, God had already given David the faith required to conquer Goliath. 1 Samuel 17, 36 says, Your servant, David speaking, has killed the, both the lion and the bear. And he says, This uncircumcised Philistine will be like one of them because he has defied the armies of the living God. God had given him the courage and the power to kill the lion and to kill the bear. And David reasoned in his mind, if God can do, give me that power, then God can give me the power to kill this big guy with the bad breath. And that's exactly what happened. But David still had to choose to trust God with this obstacle named the Goliath. And, and, and when he said, because he has defied the armies of the living God, David was bringing God right into the situation. It was really a prayer, in my opinion. He, he was telling the whole, the whole, everyone who was listening, I'm going to do it, but God's really the one doing it. When we back away from the problems God puts in our lives, we cheat ourselves out of the faith-building experiences in our lives. Every problem God gives us already has a building solution, even if our limited minds can't see it. Listen to 1 Corinthians 10, 13. No temptation has overtaken you except what is common to man. And God is faithful. He will not let you be tempted beyond what you can bear. But when you are tempted, he will also provide a way out so that you can endure it. That's God's promise. Is that when we run into these king-sized problems, that he will provide a way out. Yes, we'll be tempted. We'll have problems. But God is on our side and he will provide a way out. Mary, the mother of Jesus, was the virgin. No way she could be pregnant. But God created an impossible possibility and Jesus was born. Amen? See, Jesus is the God of the impossible. Jesus died on the cross and Satan thought, game over, I've won. But God created an impossible possibility and raised Jesus to new life. There's always a solution to your problem when God is your Savior. Amen? You, you, can, you can take that to the bank. The love of Jesus means that in every obstacle, there is a creative and maybe even an impossible possibility built right into the problem. I believe that with all my heart. Faith, you see, can move mountains because faith brings God into our situation to work on our behalf. And nothing is impossible for God. Amen? Do you believe that? Amen? When God gives us an immovable obstacle, we should sit back and marvel at what God will do. 
We, we, shouldn't, we shouldn't fear. We, we should get excited. When God gives us these unmovable obstacles, it's opportunities for us to set back and see what God will do. Amen? I've been pastoring long enough to know that many of the obstacles that we face have to do with our children, just like it, this, the man in this story. And to you who have young children, <laughs> you'll see what I'm talking about one of these days, if you haven't already. We can teach our children what's right, and we can make them to do what's right. But when that fails, we must do what this man did. We must bring them to Jesus, even if the only way we can do it is to pray for them. Amen? I mean, there, are, there is a time when our children get so old that we can't drag them to church anymore. Amen? It's just not right. Just like there comes a time when there are children get too old, we don't whip them anymore, if we ever do. But we can always pray for them. Amen? There, there, there's never a time when prayer isn't appropriate. So when we are our children are having problems and there's mountains to move, we must take it to Jesus in prayer. What did Jesus say in verse 17? Bring the boy to me. No matter what problem you are facing, bring it to Jesus. Amen? He's the answer to the problem. No matter what the problem is, no matter what your problem is, Jesus is the answer. When people come to you with a problem and you don't know what to say to them, how to help them, tell them to pray to Jesus. He's the answer to their problems, too. Now, if you have an NIV Bible, you may have noticed something peculiar here. In my NIV Bible, it says 21. But did you know what it says after that? It doesn't say anything. There is no verse 21 in the NIV Bible. Because the... Writers of the NIV Bible left verse 21 out because they didn't think it was the inspired word of God. It wasn't in the earliest manuscript, so they left it out. Now in the King James Version, verse 21 says, How be it this kind goeth out by prayer and fasting. And for this reason, since it wasn't in the earliest manuscripts, they left it out. They left verse 21 out. Now in Mark's story, in Mark's gospel, when he tells this story, there is a verse 29, and it says, this kind can come out only by prayer. I don't know if this verse, this verse 21, is inspired by God or not. I wasn't there. God hasn't included me in on it. But the one thing I can tell you is that prayer is essential in this matter. Amen? Prayer is essential. Now, Fasting is wonderful if God lays that on your heart. I have fasted many times. And um, uh, I don't know if fasting is required. Because God doesn't say to fast. He says to pray through prayer. Mark says through prayer. And fasting isn't going to hurt. But prayer is definitely going to help. Prayer is the ultimate weapon in spiritual warfare. In Ephesians 6, Paul tells us to put on the full armor of God. And then he lists all the, those weapons out. And the last one he mentions, and it's the only one he mentions more than once, and he mentions it three times. Ephesians 6 to 18. And it says, and pray, one, in the spirit, on all occasions, with all kinds of prayers. That's twice. And request, with this in mind, be alert and always keep on praying for the Lord's people. Always, three times he says, pray, pray, pray. Because prayer unlocks the endless power of God in your life. Amen? It's, we, we communicate, the vehicle that we communicate to God with is prayer. And faith is the power that unlocks the power of God in your life. Faith is the key that unlocks the power of God in your life. It is impossible to please God without faith. 
One last point, faith always moves mountain because it connects us to the maker of the m mountains, our creator. Our God works his best miracles in the mountains or in, in our problems. Amen? When you have a big problem, that's when you want God to come through. Amen? And that's when God does his best work. God is frequently revealed on the mountaintop. Isaac was saved from being sacrificed by the angel on, of God on Mount Moriah. Moriah means God will provide. Moses met God in the burning bush on the mountain called Mount Sinai. Jesus was transfigured on a mountain. Jesus was crucified on Mount Calvary. And most Bible scholars believe that Mount Calvary and Mount Moriah are one and the same mountain. God did provide on Mount Moriah. He provided for the sins of Isaac and for the sins of the whole world. Yes, the God of the Bible is the God of the mountaintop. The Hebrews call God Al Shaddai, which means God of the mountain or God Almighty. You see, to them, that mountain represented an almighty obstacle that couldn't be moved. And they saw God in the mountains. Our God can make a mountain and our God can move a mountain. Amen? Faith connects us to the God of the impossible. When God looks down from his throne in heaven and he sees a child of God who believes in the impossible, I can't even imagine how happy it makes him. Amen? What did Jesus say? He said, you are, he said, I've never seen faith like yours. Your, your, your faith is the greatest. Jesus is pleased God is pleased when we have faith that can move mountains. When we trust that our God can do anything. Now, we, we don't always need our God to do the impossible, do we? Sometimes, many times, God meets our needs in other ways. But the point is, is that God is the God who can move mountains. He's the God of the impossible. He can do anything. Faith connects us to the God of the universe, the creator. And when that happens, your life and mine become part of God's plan and purpose. And mountains are moved. Amen? The mountain of sin was moved off your shoulders. God took that mountain upon it. Jesus took that mountain upon himself and that mountain of sin is gone. Amen? I want you to remember these three principles from today's lesson. One, no problem comes into your life that God does not allow. There, there's, there's no problem that comes into your life that God didn't know about and allow to come into it. Two, every problem comes with a built-in solution. God is at work in your life. If, you're, if he is your savior, God is at work in your life. And three, the immovable and terrifying problems are opportunities to live by faith and see what God can do in your life. One of the great blessings of the Christian life is that we get to see what God will do on our behalf. Amen? God's moved. I, I know for a fact that God has moved mountains in some of your lives. He, he, he has kept you alive. He has healed you. He has met your needs. God is at work in your lives. Don't, don't ever forget it. God Almighty in heaven from your mountain throne, hear the prayers of, our, of your people. We who hurt, heal us. We who are weak, strengthen us. We who are confused, open our minds to see your endless possibilities, no matter how impossible they may seem. We pray this in the name of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. I want you to know that this Christmas season, God is going to work miracles. Amen? Let's open our eyes and look to see what Jesus will do. Be expecting God to do great things, and he will.
Lord, today I bless. I ask you to stand for the blessing. We're getting done early again today. Y'all owe me 11 minutes. <coughs> God bless you, children. Now, cause your great mercy and grace to always be with us, Lord. Help us to, to have the faith that would move any mountain because of what you do in our lives, Lord. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. God bless you. May God bless you today and always.